Be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Colossians 3, verses 18 through 21. We're really happy for your presence here tonight. Um, I'm thankful for the invitation by the elders to come and to speak. They asked me to talk about the home during this meeting, and I'm glad to be able to do that, and I hope that it'll be helpful and encouraging to each of you. If you're visiting with us and um, you're not a member of the Church of Christ and someone has invited you to come, we're so very thankful that you've come and hope you brought your Bibles and that you'll open them up and study with us from the Word of God. And if you certainly, if you have any questions or concerns, um, I'm happy to talk with you. Uh, the, the members here are happy to talk to you about um, what is taught here, what is practiced here but we're really glad that you've come. Appreciate all the kindnesses of the members here. Um, you've been very hospitable to me. Uh, you've been very kind. You've said lots of um, very encouraging things, and I, uh, I really appreciate that so very, very much. And um, I, um, as I've said before, I've been here a number of times, but I always enjoy coming here and appreciate the the good work that's being done at this place. So we've been reading Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, uh, before each of the lessons. And we're looking at these concepts, these truths that, that God has given us about our homes. And I mentioned to you that we will do um, some repetition. And if you recognize something that has been said before, uh, that's great. That's a compliment. Uh, I hope that the repetition of things will help us to better remember things. But most importantly, that we will be able to live the way God would have us to live as husband and wife, parent-child relationship in a godly home. So a couple of years ago, uh, the elders here asked me to come and to do a um, Friday, Saturday um, marriage classes. Uh, my wife was here as well. She taught one of the classes for the ladies. And some of you may recall that I presented to you some uh, statistics that um, I had collected over the years. And I want to show a little bit of that this morning or this evening. Um, I've taught uh, in churches um, about marriage. I've um, collected some data from couples about things that are needing tuned up in their marriage, things that are broken in their marriage. And I've kept statistics on that and... Um, Here's some results. So those who have been married 10 years or less, one of the main issues is communication. Second one is spiritual growth, then time alone or romance, finances, spousal roles. So what I have found, um, wherever I've been, where I've taken this information, wherever the couples are from, this is pretty much the answers every time. When we look at 11 to 20 years, communication still tops the list as either needing a tune-up or broken. Time alone, trust and forgiveness, spiritual growth. 
The next group is the 21 to 30 years, and communication is still at the top. And I'll just go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. Every set of surveys that I've done on marriage about what needs tuned up or fixed, communication is always number one. Always. You'll notice that time alone and romance has appeared every time. You'll recall that spiritual growth is also listed every time. The last category, and that's my wife and I's latest uh, photo. I thought it turned out pretty good myself, but um, communication is still a problem. Couples have been married 30 plus years still having issues of talking to each other. And spiritual growth. And number four is still on the list. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a couple of these tonight. We'll talk about some other issues tomorrow night. And I hope that it will be helpful to you and encouraging to you. Because it really... When someone comes into my office as a couple and they're having difficulties, I can close my eyes and I can hear the exact same things being said time and time again. It's a repeat. It's almost like a recording. And I've learned something about that. What I've learned about that is that people are people. You may think that you married the wrong person. If you had married someone else, you'd probably still have the same issues. As a general rule, I want you to understand that because you have issues, there are things that need to be tweaked or tuned up or maybe things that are broken. You're not the Lone Ranger. And I'm talking about members of the church. those that I've counseled that are are not members of the church, it's worse. Much worse. Communication. I think I've told this story. Um, I've told it many times. It proves the point. Um, When my wife and I were living in another uh, state a little further south, we came home to see my parents who were living in Kentucky at the time. And um, we were sitting around the table and my mother had fixed a big, big pot of chili. And my mom made great chili. And so she's filling up the bowls. She's passing them around. She puts a bowl in front of my dad first. He's sitting at the end of the table. And as she's continually passing the bowls around to everyone, we're getting ready to eat chili. My mom notices that my dad is not eating his chili. So she looked at him and she said to him, what is wrong with you? He looked at her and he said, I'm not eating that. My, wa- uh, my mother was a very kind, tender-hearted, soft-spoken person. She said, you are too. Eat it. He said, nope, I'm not eating it. She says, you've been eating it for 40 years. He says, yep, and I've hated it. I don't like chili. I ain't never liked chili and I'm never going to eat any more of your chili. So my wife and I and our children are sitting there watching this. It's very tense in that kitchen. We're not exactly sure what's going to happen next. But I got to thinking about that, and I'm taking notes, you know, 
for future reference. I thought, how does a couple live together 40 years and they not know that one of them doesn't like chili? How does that happen? I'll tell you how that happens. Ain't no communication. So just as a, a, a take-home exam question, on your way home tonight, just ask your spouse, do you like chili? Just ask them. Might surprise you. Might surprise you. So communication in homes many times is like this. And shouting, ridicule, threats is not godly conversation. Many homes, this is what they do. Is that rather than have a discussion, they have this shouting contest. And there's ridicule. There are threats. Someone once said, the difference between a discussion and an argument. A discussion is an exchange of information between two intelligent people. An argument is an exchange of stupidity between two stupid people. So you might just think about spouses. Do you have discussions or do you have arguments? In 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, there's an interesting thing that Peter, who is a married man, he's a preacher, he's an elder in the church, he's an apostle, and he says, husbands need to live with their wives in an understanding way. I have a little book in my office and the title of it is, in real colorful letters, All That Men Know About Women. And I take that to my marriage classes right at the beginning, and I have the men to look at it. And when they open it up, there's nothing on any of the pages. It's all blank. That's about how much we know. And that's why there's issues. But the Bible says, live with your wife in an understanding way. That, by implication, means that we can learn what we don't know. So, when we're talking about communication, we're talking about sitting down and having a discussion with each other. We need to talk to each other. And we need to listen. The traditional idea of a man having a conversation with his wife is him sitting in his easy chair, the ball game is on, he has a newspaper, and his wife is telling him about all of the issues of the day, and he's going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And if she wants to slip in something like, I robbed a bank today, he would say, that's great, honey. And the point being, he's not paying a bit of attention to what she's saying. So, one of the most important aspects of communication is listening. To actually hear what the person is saying. Giving it credit that what they're saying, they believe. It's true. They're sincere. It's a problem. It's an issue. It's important. Any time when any of us talk to someone else other than our spouses and they don't listen to us, you know they're not listening. You know that they're, they, they just don't care about what you're saying. That is very frustrating 
very aggravating. It upsets you to no end. We should not, spouses, be satisfied with not listening to our spouses. You need to spend time with each other. One of the things that comes up on these surveys all the time, we don't have enough time together. I don't think I put a chart on this lesson or tomorrow night's, but I'll just verbalize it. When you look at time, we all have the same amount. Some of us don't think we have the same amount of time as others, but we do. It's how we use it. Spouses, you must make time for each other. You must make time for each other to be able to talk, to be with each other. Number one in your life is God and is always God. Second is your spouse. Third is your children. Fourth is others. When homes make children number one, there's going to be a major problem. God is always number one. When parents make children more important than themselves, they're going to have problems. Children must understand that as well and be taught that. So when we're talking to each other, it requires time. There's quality time and there's quantity time. Children don't understand the difference. Neither do wives. Husbands, wives want, need, lots of time from you. They know you're working. They know you're busy. They know it's the big game today. They know those things. But they still need your time and attention. When we talk about communication, there's a golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. That must be followed in the husband-wife relationship. As a general rule, and I'm painting with a very broad brush stroke here. As a general rule, men, young men, husbands, are very selfish. They're very self-centered. Many times they're all about hunting, fishing, their buddies, playing ball. And if the wife is not interested in those things, she's at home by herself a lot. I'm not saying that it's wrong for husbands to do any of those things. But what we are talking about is that you got married to share life with each other. You didn't get married to stay apart from one another and do your own thing. And when you're doing your own thing and going different directions all the time, you will grow apart. God intends us to grow together, to be one, to share, to be with each other. Quick story. I'm a sports person. When I, we first got married, found out my wife didn't know even much what the name of sports was, whether it was baseball or football or what the point was. I didn't marry her because she liked sports. So the challenge for me was 
to try to figure out what we could do together, what she would enjoy. And that was difficult because I found out she didn't like much anything. But she married me and she wanted to be with me. Early on, I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. I didn't appreciate that. But finally, I learned. Because she was patient, because she was loving, and because she sat me down and talked to me. And I finally listened. One year, we took a vacation week. We went to Tennessee, and we traveled all the roads that on a map, not a phone thing, but a real map, where all the little roads were black, the little bitty ones, and the little towns that don't show up on GPS. And we went in search of blue dishes. My wife started collecting blue dishes. She got a hobby. She wanted to do that. I would rather have a root canal <laughs> than to look for blue dishes. But I found out and I understood she would rather have a root canal than watch a ball game. So I felt like I needed to do all I could to appreciate what she liked. We spent a whole week traveling the back roads of Tennessee, to all these little small little towns, going into every little, you know, uh, antique shop that there was, and we looked and looked, and we, we, we spent most of the week looking for those blue dishes and didn't find any. The last day on our way home, my wife said, there's one. She had said that that week um, many times. So we stopped one more time. We got out and we walked in the front door. Ah, oh, Sangarala. Blue dishes everywhere. And I was looking for the guy in charge or the woman in charge. And I was just going to say, we'll take all of them. <laughs> My wife, she looked and she looked and she looked. And I got, I got to notice and she didn't have any dishes in her hands. And I asked her, I said, baby, what's, what, what's, what's the deal? I mean, here's that that you mentioned. And here's this one you mentioned. And here's, here's this one that you said you wanted. And here it is and this and that one. She says, you know, I don't think I'm going to buy anything today. Oh. Now, the difference in men and women, there's lots of differences. When I need a new shirt, I go to the first store I can find. I go to the shirt, and if it's the color I want, I buy it. I'm out of there. My wife has to look at every rack in the whole store. Differences. So I said to my wife, I said, baby, I love you very much. I said, we've taken a whole week of vacation just so you could do this. I said, I'm happy to do that. But we are not leaving here without a lot of dishes. So we bought some dishes. She was appreciative. That did me a lot of good that week. Because I was doing what she wanted to do. But I wouldn't have known that if she hadn't communicated that to me. The reality of watching your tongue, how you talk to each other. In Matthew chapter 12, 36 through 37, Jesus makes it very, very clear that your words make a big difference about where you're going to spend eternity. When you speak to your spouse in an unkind, ugly, cursing way, You'll give an account of that to God. Answering softly. 
Proverbs says, a soft answer turns away wrath. Rather than shouting, rather than hollering at one another, soft answer. Mean what you say. If you say yes, you mean yes. When you say no, you mean no. When you say I love you, you mean it. When you say I'm sorry, you mean it. Mean what you say. And say what you mean. I listed that again. Did you all notice that? Because being a great listener is really important. I want to talk to you just a second about conflict resolution. My personal judgment in our world today, people do not want to have any kind of conflict. They will compromise. They will do whatever it takes just not to go there, be that, do that. No conflicts. In the home, you are going to have conflicts. Husbands and wives will have differences. Parents, children will have differences. You must be able to resolve a conflict. And one of the ways that you do that, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 24, is the text that Jesus talks about on the Sermon on the Mount about the fact that, you know, you're going to make uh, your uh, sacrifice and, and you remember that there's a conflict with someone, you leave the offering there, you go make it right, and then go make the sacrifice. I got to thinking about that. How many times has there been conflict in the home Husband, wife, parent, child. And we go off to church, all mad at one another, all upset with one another. There's been an ugly, harsh thing said. There's been ugly things done. And we go off and we come into worship services and we sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. And we're lying through our teeth. It's important that we understand that when we are not husbands living godly lives with our wives, our prayers do not get above the ceiling. Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, yes, live with your wives in an understanding way, but treating her with the respect and honor as the weaker vessel, lest your prayers be hindered. So husbands, you need to understand that when there is a conflict with your spouse, you don't just ignore it. You don't just walk away from it. You don't just let it lie. As a godly man and as a godly leader, we'll talk more about that tomorrow night, it's your job to fix it. I don't know how many husbands I've made angry at me in a counseling session and there's a problem and the wife has constantly for years been waving the red flag and talking to him and trying to get him to understand there's an issue and when nothing changes, nothing changes. Then when she has or else him and they're in my office, and I hear what's been going on for years, the first thing I have to say, I look at him and I say, it's your fault. You're the head. You're in charge. You should have fixed it. Most men don't want to hear but it's true. James 5, 19 through 20 talks about how great it is, how wonderful it is when one 
helps another to come out of their sin, to do the right thing. Did you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, that as husbands and wives, that applies to us as well? Is it a heaven or hell issue? Have you ever heard the saying, well, they're just making a mountain out of a molehill? You heard that expression? What does that mean? They're taking something that's insignificant and they're making a big deal of it. We can do that. We must, in conflict resolution, we must make sure that we're talking about something that is life and death, that's heaven and hell. If it's a judgment issue, if it's a molehill kind of thing, yeah, we probably need to discuss it. But we need to understand both of us are going to have to have the willingness to say, let's just forget that. Let's not make a big deal out of something that's not a big deal or is not important. Make time to talk to each other privately. Kids at bed. Kids at grandma's. Don't have these kinds of conflict resolution meetings when the children are sitting right there. They don't need to hear that. The rules. Ephesians 4 Verses 25 through 32 is an excellent rule book. Look at that with me just briefly. Ephesians chapter 4 and beginning then at verse 25. Therefore laying aside falsehood, don't lie to one another. Don't ever, ever lie to one another. Husbands, you may be a lot of things, but never be a liar. Wives, you may be a lot of things, but never, ever be a liar. Verse 6, 26, be angry and yet do not sin. It's okay to be upset. Girls, it's okay to cry. But don't sin. Control yourself. Don't give the devil an opportunity, verse 27. Did you know the devil is just looking for an opportunity to tear you apart? Don't give him an opportunity. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. If it's ugly, don't say it. If it's unkind, don't say it. Verse 29 says, only a word that is good for edification. When you're having a conflict resolution, if you're constantly throwing stones and hurtful words, you're not going to make this go away. You're not going to resolve it. You're going to make it worse. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness and wrath and anger. 32, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. You began and end with prayer. You know what's really tough with your spouse? You've had a fuss. You're both angry. Now let's pray together. Be open. Be truthful. Be loving. Be kind. Pursue peace when you talk to each other. If you did wrong, repent. And forgive. Now I'm going to suggest, nobody has to raise their hands. Don't want to throw anybody under the bus. My guess is, I'm just guessing, this is based on a lot of years of couples sitting in my office, Most Christian couples 
have never ever practiced that. And you're probably sitting there, well, we've never done that. I don't care how long you've been married, five minutes or 50 years. If you've never done that, start. This will promote a closeness to your spouse that you didn't know you could have. It'll draw you closer together. So we looked at these particular surveys. And there's another one here that is very common to all of them. And for the next few moments, I want to talk to you a little bit about this. So this is where it gets a little more tense. If you work on your communication, you're a long ways down the road to resolving any other issue. If you can't talk to each other, you'll have to come see me or Jason or somebody. If you can talk to each other, you can resolve these other issues. So I want to talk to you a little bit about keeping romance alive. Now, this is not going to be dirty. This is not going to be, you know, I'm not have pictures of stuff or whatever. But look at that nice couple there. Don't they just look very romantic, handsomely in love? Is that you and your spouse? Well, a man needs a companion. We, we read yesterday from Genesis 2 where God created man, put him in the garden, gave him work to do, and, and kept the thorn bushes out for him at the first. But God said it's not good for man to be alone. He created for him a helper. And a woman was exactly what a man needed. Secondly, when we think about a home, a woman needs to be cared for. She needs to feel like she is cared about. Men can be all about their job. And there's nothing wrong with a man being all about his job. But why are you working that job? So you can take care of that little woman you fell in love with and you married. Don't forget her. Sometimes men get so wrapped up in work that they forget about her and them, the children. Helping around the house is something that I hear Christian wives saying all the time. Not as needing tweaked or tuned up, but is completely broken. They feel like they have no help at home with dishes, with housework, with washing, with whatever it is. But especially, and this is really sad, with the children. I've had the opportunity to have some marriage classes at Anderson, where I've been now going on 10 years. We've got a bunch of young couples like you all have, lots of babies. And I see this beautiful young woman coming in the front door on Sunday morning, and she's hipping two of them. She's got a diaper bag around her shoulder, and she's carrying the Bibles. And here comes the old man in with nothing in his hands, and hands in his pocket, walking in, and hey, how y'all doing? And his wife looks like a pack mule. And I tell you what's the first thing that comes to my mind when I see that. What a lazy husband and father you are. I was raised different than that. I was taught to be helpful 
to my mother to help with those kinds of things. I ran the vacuum when I was a teenager in the house. I washed dishes when I was a teenager in the house. I'm suggesting to us, we're talking about keeping romance alive. When a woman realizes that her husband doesn't care anything about her to help with these kinds of things and help with the children and take some of her load off and her burden make it less, and then later on he wants to be frisky and she ain't in the mood, he can't figure it out because he's dumber than a stump. I'm being pretty straightforward about this, guys, because you're sitting there and you are saying in your mind, I'm guilty of that. And if you are, change. Change. Isn't it great to see older couples holding hands? They, in preaching these kinds of lessons, I know Jason has experienced the same thing. Andrew probably has too. And preaching these kinds of lessons and you have this sweet little uh, 90-year-old lady, she comes out and she said, well, I was married uh, 65 years and said, oh, it was just a beautiful thing and I miss my husband. He was such a good man. What would your spouse say about you if you were dead? Boy, I'm glad that bum's gone. He wasn't worth anything around here. He didn't help me with nothing. He didn't do nothing. And he wasn't worth nothing. What would your spouse say? I mentioned this yesterday. And I didn't give you enough information. So in the last seven minutes, I'm going to give you more information than you want. The Bible says to drink well from your own, uh, water from your own well. And that's recorded for us in Proverbs chapter 5, 15 through 21. So will you please just briefly turn to that passage, and I want to read just a bit from that passage because it's very helpful to us. Proverbs chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. The text says, Drink water from your own cistern, a fresh and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving and hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with, the, with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord and, is, and he watches all his paths. Let me tell you, do you remember I started off by saying in this section that a man needs a companion? For whatever reasons, the honeymoon doesn't last long enough. And before long, the husband doesn't seem to be interested anymore. There could be lots of reasons for that. I'm going to say something that's very important. Men, you need to drink water from your own well. You don't need to be shopping around for new wells. You don't need to be looking around and admiring other wells. The old law says you shall not covet your neighbor's wife to look, to lust, to want, to desire. Always wanting something different and new. The Bible is teaching us to keep romance alive, it's all about your desire, your intent, 
your purpose, your love for God, and your love for your spouse. I've heard guys say, well, ever since I met my wife and we've been married, I've never ever looked at another woman. And that is awesome. That, that, that should be the goal of every man. But that's not how it usually works. Unfaithfulness destroys marriages. Proverbs 6, verses 24 through 35 talks about that in depth. Please read that. Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. That word judge there has to do with condemn. You may not, you may keep it from your spouse, but God knows. There are lots of fornicating starters. Guys, women, you need to be careful what you look at. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in tender love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Pornography is rampant. Cell phones are great. I don't know how I would travel outside of the United States without a cell phone. We used to. <laughs> this is not going to make anybody happy. I think we'd be a whole lot better off if we threw all of our computers away. And the TV with it. Now, there ain't none of us going to do that. Why, I can have a computer and I can have a TV and I'll be just fine. Well, that's great. I've had the misfortune of having to have counseling sessions with many young couples just married. And one of them be hooked on pornography. And it's already destroyed their marriage before they get started. <clears throat> pornography is a bad thing, guys. And you have got to learn not to look. Job. Job 31, verse 1. Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I might not look lustfully upon a maiden. Guys, you've got to make up your mind. You're just not going to look at that stuff. A number of years ago, I was serving as one of the elders of the church in a land far, far away. And we decided to have a weekend series on addictions. And this fellow came, and one of the lessons was pornography. And um, afterwards, we decided as an eldership to allow this man who was had all kinds of credentials for counseling with addictions. And we set up a time to where people that wanted to come and talk to him about their addictions and how they could get help. And there was a number of people that came. They were all women. 
and they were all hooked to, hooked on pornography. I, I'm going to have to say to you that that was a shock to me, that it was women. So lest you be deceived, this is not just a male issue. Reading all sorts of romance novels, watching kinds of programs and stuff that is all about sex and you can have 14 affairs on the side and still have a happy, wonderful home. That, that is baloney. That is not the Bible. That is not truth. I'm going to add one more here. I was talking to Brother Bill Hall here not too awful long ago. and I told him, I said, Brother Bill, I said, I, I don't know. I, I preach on immodesty all the time, and it seems like it gets worse. It's kind of like giving. <laughs> I preach in a local church about we need to give more, and the contribution goes down. You preach on modesty and it gets worse. I was shocked to hear Brother Bill say to me, he said, we lost the war on modesty years ago. Because you know what's going to happen? Myself, others, get up and preach and teach about these kinds of things. And then brethren just go and do what they want to. And elders, in many places, not having the backbone to be executors of the will of God and enforce truth. One little quick story. I was preaching a meeting in this place far, far away. And I preached on modesty. There was a couple of elders. They huddled around me and said, said, we just had an issue here with that. Said there was a couple that came in. And she was dressed immodestly. We talked to each other as elders. What are we going to do? And so they decided that they were going to meet with the husband. And they told the husband that his wife was immodest when she came to church. And that as her husband, he needed to take care of that. And he said he would. I interrupted and I said, well, I guess they never came back. He said, no, they came back. Says so she's never worn immodest dress since. Brethren, that's the way it's supposed to work. Amen. It takes husbands to have enough courage to be leaders in their home. It takes wives that are willing to be submissive to their husbands and to God. And what is happening? We've got many of our Christian ladies are trying to lure the attention of their husbands back home where they need to have their attention and they're doing it in an ungodly way. And we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Brethren, we need to wake up to that. Dressing sexy and looking hot and all that. I don't even know all the terminology today that people use. But I do know this. That both of these passages in 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Peter 3, both of them tell women to dress godly.
I don't think it's my job to tell you how short, how long, how tight, how whatever. This is a heart issue. And both men and women are greatly displaying their worldly hearts by the way you dress and the way you allow your children to dress. And it has a great effect on your home being a godly home. May God Almighty help us to do better, to improve. Well, that's what I come to tell you tonight. Some of that was a little heavy. I understand. But I have a really good feeling that most of you can handle that. If you have any questions about what I said tonight, I'm happy to talk to you about it. If you're not a Christian, becoming a child of God is something you need to do. There's a baptistry here. There's water in the baptistry. There's clothes here. You, you can be baptized into Christ this very night. I've gone nine minutes over. If Jesus comes at 8.15... You going to be ready? Because he might just come at 8.15. Won't you come as we stand and sing?